Topic 2 Cells and Viruses 2.1 Eukaryotic Cells Describe how to use a microscope. First we're going to know what the different parts of a microscope are. So here is a light microscope and it's a light microscope because light has to pass through the specimen to help magnify the image. And to magnify the image you have to use lens and there are two types of lens. You've got the eyepiece lens which is the lens that you look through and then you've got the objective lens and this is the lens that you can change to increase the magnification. So which objective lens do we start off with? We always start off with the lowest power objective lens and the reason for this is because it's easier to then locate the specimen using the lowest power objective lens. After that once you've located your specimen you want to be able to focus the image more clearer and the way to do that is by using the coarse focus wheel. When you use the coarse focus wheel, you should use it on the lowest power objective lens first before you use it on the higher power objective lens. Once you move on to the higher power objective lens, which increases the magnification, you could then use the fine focus wheel. But this should only be used in the higher power objective lens because it will not make a huge difference when using it on the lower power objective lens. So to work out the magnification when you're looking through the eyepiece, remember magnification is how many times larger something appears than the real actual size. So if it's got a magnification of times 30, that means that the image is 30 times larger than its true actual size. And when looking through the eyepiece, the total magnification clearly is going to be affected by not only the eyepiece lens, but also the objective lens. So the equation clearly is going to be the eyepiece lens magnification multiplied by the objective lens magnification. So if you use a times 10 eyepiece lens and you use a times 4 objective lens, then the total magnification will be times 40. It will be 40 times larger than its actual size. Now here you can see two dots. And we can, using our eyes, we can see them apart, and we can still see those two dots apart. But here we can't distinguish those two dots. So this has got to do with resolution. And the resolution is the smallest distance between two points that we can distinguish as two separate structures or lines. So our eyes can't distinguish the two dots on the third example, but we can on the first and the second. So the resolution of our eyes is somewhere up to the smallest value of 10 to the minus 4 meters, which is roughly 100 micrometer. Now, when you use a light microscope, the magnification is limited due to too low a resolution. And that's because the wavelength of a visible light is more than the beam of electrons. So light microscope is better than our eyes in terms of magnification. However, due to too low resolution, because wavelengths of visible light is more than a beams of electrons, it's not a high enough resolution in comparison to an electron microscope. So electron microscope has got an even higher resolution than a light microscope, and that's because the shorter wavelength for electrons can distinguish between the separate structures or lines. So the highest resolution would be the electron microscope, which is higher than a light microscope, and the light microscope is obviously a higher resolution than our eyes. The electron microscope also increases the magnification more than light microscope, and the light microscope clearly can increase the magnification more than our eye because of the fact that it will have a higher resolution, but not as high as the electron microscope. And the exam, if you want to get extra marks, you've got to mention the wavelength. You want to say the wavelength of visible light is going to be more when using the light microscope than our eye, but it's less than the beam of electrons or wavelength of electrons when using an electron microscope. Here we've also got another image and this image has been magnified. And to work out the magnification of this water flea, we're not looking through an eyepiece lens, so we're not going to use the same equation. This is an image where we want to use the I am formula equation. So I stands for the image size, A is the actual size, and M is the magnification. 
And to work out the image size, you'd cover the eye, so therefore it'd be actual size multiplied by magnification. To work out the actual size, again, you'd cover that in the triangle, and it would be image size divided by magnification. And then to work out the magnification, it would be image size divided by actual size. And when working out the magnification using the IM formula, we've got to be able to convert units. So here we've got a one meter ruler, and this one meter ruler, if we want to convert it into millimeters, we know that one meter should equal 1,000 millimeters. So therefore, what do we have to do to the number one? We have to multiply it by a thousand. So one meter equals a thousand millimeters, and any number of meter we can multiply by a thousand to convert it into millimeters. And then the reverse is true also when we convert from millimeters into meters, we divide it by a thousand. And so this is the thousand rule. All of these units, you could either multiply by a thousand or divide by a thousand to go from one unit to the next. So a millimeter, if you multiply a thousand, you'd go on to micrometers. So one millimeter would equal to a thousand micrometers. And again, to convert from micro, a smaller unit, to millimeter, a larger unit, you would divide by a thousand. So the general rule is always use a thousand to go from a larger unit, such as a meter, to a smaller unit, a millimeter, you'd multiply by a thousand. To go from a smaller unit to a larger unit, you would divide by a thousand. So again, to go from micrometer, if you were to multiply by a thousand, therefore it'd be a smaller unit. So in this case, it's a nanometer, and then smaller than a nanometer multiplied by a thousand, it'd be one nanometer would equal one thousand picometer. And again, to go from a smaller unit to a larger unit, from pico to nano, then to micro or to milli or to meter, you would then divide by a thousand each time. So let's look at an example of that water flea again. So here's a water flea. We know it's been magnified. We're not looking through an eyepiece, we're actually looking at it directly using our eyes. So we're going to use the IM formula. And they've told us in this exam question that this actual size is 700 micrometers. So how many times has it been magnified by? So if we're going to work out magnification, it's image size divided by actual size. So we got to measure the image size. So that's where you've got to use a ruler. And if you're going to use a thousand rule, when measuring it with a ruler, you can't measure it with centimeters. It doesn't follow the thousand rule. So you're going to go from meter to millimeter. Therefore, it's best to measure things using a ruler using millimeter. So this should be 70 millimeters instead. And then the problem with this is you can't do 70 divided by 700 because your units are not the same. So you've got to convert either the millimeter into micrometer or the micrometer into millimeter. And the big tip I would give is always convert the larger unit into the smaller unit because then you're multiplying. If you do it the other way around, you might get really small numbers below um, one. So it might be zero point something. So it's easier to convert the large unit to the smaller one. So in this case, millimeter is the large unit. And to go from millimeter to micrometer, we use the thousand rule. We multiply a thousand. So 70 times a thousand should be 70,000 micrometers. And then now we just do 70,000 divided by 700 because the units are the same. And that equals times 100 because the units will cancel each other out. So this means that this image of a water flea is 100 times larger than actual um, size. So again, um, here are the tips for um, these magnification calculations when using the IM formula. To go from a larger unit to a smaller unit, you multiply by 1,000. To go from a smaller unit to a larger unit, you divide by 1,000. It's easier to convert a larger unit to a smaller unit because you're multiplying instead of dividing. And make sure you're measuring in millimeters using a ruler because the thousand rule doesn't apply to centimeters. Um, another tip is make sure the units of the image size and actual size are the same. So that's where you've got to do the conversions. And sometimes when you're doing conversions, you might have been given the answer in standard form, or you might have to convert it in standard form. So standard form is when you have a number between one and 10, and then you multiply it by 10 to the power of 
m. And so if the number is larger than um, 10, if we look at this example here, we've got 1,150,000. So you can see the number between 1 and 10 would be 1.15. And currently, we want to put the decimal point here, but this is where it currently is. So how many times are we shifting it by? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So therefore, it's 10 to the power of 6. So we've got a number between 1 and 10, 1.15, and it's times 10 to the power of 6. In the example below, we've got a number below 1. So again, what is that number between 1 and 10 going to be? We can see it's going to be 7. But this time around, we want to put the decimal point here. And so we're going to shift it towards the right. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And this time it's going to be, because it's shifted to the right, a negative. So it's going to be 10 to the power of minus 8. So that's how you do standard form. Here we've got an image. We're looking through a light microscope of an onion cell. And it's very hard to see the structures. So one way that's easier to see the structures is if you actually add a stain. So explain the importance of staining specimens in microscope. Why do we stain? The stain provides greater contrast in seeing the cell parts that would not be clearly visible by attaching to specific parts or types of the cell. So when you add a stain, it gives greater contrast to those parts that are not very visible and how it does that is because the stain attaches to those parts of the cells to make it a lot more clearer, clearer in terms of visibility. So here are some examples of stains you've got to know, but not necessarily for topic two, but these are some common um, stains that you definitely need to learn about. So we've got iodine stains. And iodine you learn from GCC um, is a stain used in plant cells, and it can actually uh, stain plant cell nucleus brown, but the one you haven't learned in GCC is it stains starch grains or anything with, to do with starch, you would stain it blue black. Then in the next example here, we could see cells that are dividing. So this is an example of mitosis. And in mitosis, if you want to see the, how the chromosomes are distributed during uh, mitotic cell division, you'd use acidic orsin stains. And that's because you can see the DNA to see how the stages of mitosis in the meristem root tip. So those are the part of a plant where you've got uh, mitotic cell division. And then a final stain you could use is staining um, to see the different types of bacteria, which we'll learn about later on. Um, and they are gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria. And when you stain them, first you stain them with a crystal violet iodine stain. And that attaches to the thick peptidoglycan cell wall in gram-positive bacteria. However, in gram-negative bacteria, because they don't have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall, the gram-negative bacteria takes up the red saffron cancer stain instead. So that's something I'll discuss later on. So core practical two is when you have to use the light microscope, including simple stage and eyepiece micrometers, and be able to draw some small number of cells from specialized tissue. So describe how to use a micrometer to determine how many times bigger a drawing is than actual size. So the first thing you want to note down in exam is you've got to be calibrating the eyepiece practical. And to calibrate the eyepiece practical, you use a stage micrometer. When you use the stage micrometer, then you measure the length of cells using, as you can see, we can use the IP squatical, because now we know how much each length of the IP squatical units are, because we use the stage micrometer. And you should take more than one measurement, because then it would be a lot more accurate. So you can measure repeats of different cells or the length and breadth of um, cells as well. And then once you know the size, you'd use the magnification calculation because you want to obviously compare it to our drawing. So now we've got uh, the actual size, you'd use the IM formula. So it'd be image size, which is the length of cell in the drawing, divided by the actual size, the one that we measured using the microscope. 
and that would give you the magnification of our drawing. Sometimes when you make a specimen, you see things like this through the eyepiece. Um, so state why it's important or how you can avoid air bubbles on a microscope slide. Why is it important? It's because the air bubbles obscure the view. So that means details can't be seen very easily. So how could you avoid it? You place a specimen flat on a slide using stain or water added to it. And then you hold the cover slip at an angle, just touching the stain or water. And then what you do with the cover slip is once it's touching the liquid, you lower that cover slip gently. And this reduces the chance of air bubbles forming. Explain cell theory. So cell theory is all living things are made up of one or more cells. So if you've got to be something living, an organism, you have to be made up of at least one or more cells. Where do these cells come from? All cells arise from pre-existing cells by division. And the cell is the fundamental unit of if you look at this, structure and function in all living organisms. Explain in complex organisms, cells are organized into, so we've got our cell, clearly they're gonna be organized into tissues, organs, and then organ systems, which then make up an organism. So tissues are groups of similar cell types, and organs would be a group of different tissues. So that means you'd have different cells, but those cells would then group, have different groups of those cells that are similar. And then organ system is when you have groups of organs working together to carry out a specific function in the body. So for instance, the circulatory system, you'd have organs such as the heart, but then you'd also have the blood vessels involved as well. And those are examples where you have organs working together to carry out a specific function in the body. 2.2 prokaryotic cells. Describe outer structure of prokaryotic cells and structures of organelles. Here is a, a diagram of a prokaryotic cell. It's a bacteria, and bacteria contain a 70s ribosome where protein synthesis occurs. In eukaryotic cells, it is 80 Svedberg units. They also have a cell wall and that provides support, protection, strength, and it's made of peptidoglycan. They have a nucleoid, which is a single length of coil DNA. So this is different. There's no nucleus in prokaryotic cells. And they also contain plasmids, which are small circular DNA coding for bacterial phenotype, for an example, antibiotic resistance. So they can produce um, antibiotic resistant um, proteins using genetic information from these plasmids. Distinguish between gram-positive and gram-negative bacterial cell walls. So here's a diagram of the cell walls of both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria and to distinguish between them you do gram staining. And if we look at the difference in structure, the gram-positive bacteria have a thick layer of peptidoglycan in their cell wall, whereas gram-negative bacteria have a thin layer which is inside an outer lipid membrane. When you stain gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, you could distinguish them because the gram-positive bacteria retains the crystal violet iodine stain because it attaches to the thick peptidoglycan cell wall, whereas this crystal violet iodine stain uh, is washed off so it doesn't retain in gram-negative bacteria and therefore you could then counter stain it with the red saffron counter stain which shows up as this sort of pinkish sort of color so gram-positive bacteria after using gram staining shows up with the crystal violet color whereas gram-negative you have the saffron counter stain Due to their structure, their effectiveness of antibiotics will be different. So certain antibiotics can inhibit peptidoglycan formation, and those are the ones ha that have an effect on gram-positive bacteria. Other antibiotics can't get past the peptidoglycan layer, 
So that means that these are the ones that will only be effective in gram negative bacteria because of the fact that they can't go past the thick layer of peptidoglycan in gram positive bacteria. So depending on the effectiveness of antibiotic, uh, there are some that inhibit the peptidoglycan formation and they have an effect on gram positive bacteria or they can't cross the peptidoglycan layer so they have an effect only on gram negative bacteria. When using gram staining, the staining allows classification of bacteria as most bacteria are transparent or colorless. So using gram staining helps to distinguish whether they're gram positive bacteria or gram negative, and therefore you could target the bacterial infection based on um, which type of bacteria or how they're classified after using gram staining. And here's an example of how you could do gram staining where using crystal violet dye and then iodine stain, the gram positive bacteria will retain that crystal violet iodine stain because it's got a thick layer of peptidoglycan that it attaches to. So when you use the alcohol wash, it doesn't wash off. However, in gram negative, because the peptidoglycan is a thin layer, um, the alcohol will wash it off. And then when you counter stain it with saffron, the saffron then attaches to the gram negative bacteria. So that's how you could distinguish between both types using gram staining. Describe architecture of animal eukaryotic cells and function of organelles. So some of these organelles you didn't learn in GCSE, um, but you want to learn some additional ones for A-level. So first of all, you've got nucleus. And if you have to draw a nucleus in your A-level exam, you should draw it as a double membrane. Um, which has pores, which we learned from in protein synthesis, where the mRNA leaves the nucleus through the nuclear pore to reach ribosomes. So the nucleus should be drawn as a double membrane with pores, and its function is obviously to store DNA, which is the genetic information. Within the nucleus, you've got the nucleolus, and this is a region of dense DNA and protein where ribosomes are produced. You've then got additional structures in the cell, such as centrioles. And if you had to describe centrioles in the exam, there are two hollow cylinders which are arranged at right angles to each other. And you would come across centrioles because they make the spindle fibers in both mitotic and meiosis cell division. You've got lysosomes, also in a cell of eukaryotes. They're enclosed by a single membrane and they contain digestive enzymes which destroy old organelles and pathogens. And then you've got the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a network of interconnected tubules. And there's two types of ER. You've got the rough endoplasmic reticulum, RER, and they're a series of single flattened sacs enclosed by a membrane. And the reason why they're rough is because they've got ribosomes on the surface. Um, and that's where proteins can be synthesized, just like um, free ribosomes also found in the cytoplasm. But these ones are attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is different. They're also a series of singular sacs, but here the sacs are tubular structure, also made of membrane. And this is the site of lipids being synthesized. There are also free ribosomes in the cytoplasm, the ATS units, so in eukaryotic cells, there's 80 spedvec units, sites of protein synthesis in comparison to prokaryotes who have 70S um, in ribosomes. And in, in terms of their structure, they're described as two subunits with a groove. Eukaryotic cells also have mitochondria where aerobic respiration occurs, which we'll discuss the structure later on. And then there's also a Golgi apparatus, which can be described as stacks of curved cisternae involved in protein modification. So after proteins have been synthesized in ribosomes, whether it's free ribosomes or in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they can be transported to the Golgi apparatus and the proteins can then be further modified there. Describe ultrastructure of plant eukaryotic cells and functions of organelles. 
So this where we're looking at the additional structures of plants in comparison to the ones that I've already described for animal eukaryotic cells. And if we look at a plant cell, they can have a cell wall which provides support, protection and strength. And the reason why they could do that is because they have a cell wall that's made of cellulose. They've also got chloroplasts, which can absorb light energy to produce glucose by photosynthesis. Plant eukaryotic cells also have a permanent vacuole that stores cell sap, and that maintains the structure to keep the cell firm. They also have a tonoplast, and the tonoplast is the vacuole membrane. And that controls the movement of substance into and out of the vacuole, thus controls the water potential of the cell. Compare and contrast outer structures of eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. So what are the similarities and differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes in terms of their cells? So eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, the similarities is they both have cytoplasm, cell membrane, and ribosomes. In eukaryotic cells, there are membrane-bound organelles, such as the mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Those are examples you give in the exam. Whereas in prokaryotic cells, there are no membrane-bound organelles. The ribosomes are also different. In eukaryotic cells, there are the larger 80S ribosomes, whereas in prokaryotes, there's the smaller 70S ribosomes. Eukaryotic cells have got a nucleus, obviously with their nuclear envelope, with the nucleolus inside, where ribosomes are synthesized. Whereas in prokaryotic cells, there's no nucleus. Instead, there is a nucleoid, which is a free-floating genetic material in the cytoplasm. The prokaryotic cells also have got plasmid, which is not found in eukaryotic cells. And then in eukaryotic cells, only in plants, they have got cellular cell wall. However, the cell wall in prokaryotic cells are peptidoglycan. Claw and label a mitochondria. So this is what a mitochondrial structure looks like. It's got both an outer and inner membrane, and that inner membrane folds inwards to form the crista. Mitochondria also contains ribosomes, and they also have a fluid structure inside, similar to a cytoplasm, which is known as the matrix. Explain why a cell may contain large numbers of mitochondria. So we know mitochondria from GCC is where aerobic respiration happens, and that aerobic respiration produces ATP, which can then be used to release energy for chemical reactions and cell processes such as protein synthesis, such as when enzymes and hormones, which are proteins, can be synthesized. Also can be used to modify proteins or to transport or secrete them using transport processes such as active transport or exocytosis. Draw and label a chloroplast. So this is what chloroplast looks like, and both mitochondria and chloroplast will learn in detail their functions in topic five. Chloroplasts also contain ribosomes. They've got starch grain where starch is stored from glucose that's been produced in photosynthesis that is then polymerized to form the starch polymer. Chloroplasts also contain an outer and inner membrane. They've got a thylakoid structure which are stacked together to form the granum. And then these granums are linked together through a lamella. And they've also got a fluid structure inside, similar to cytoplasm, but it's called the stroma. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts also contain DNA. So one theory is that they were originally the ancestors of prokaryotes, or there were prokaryotes before, and they were then engulfed into eukaryotes. And through a symbiotic relationship, they kept their functions where mitochondria released energy for eukaryotes and chloroplasts produce glucose for plant eukaryotes. Describe role of Golgi apparatus in producing secreted enzymes. So as we stated earlier, the Golgi apparatus is a site where proteins can be modified. So these proteins are first synthesized in ribosomes, such as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So first, those uh, proteins are inside vesicles, 
that are in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then they fuse with the Golgi. The Golgi apparatus then modifies these proteins, so you could glycosylate it, which just means adding carbohydrates or adding lipids, forming the quaternary structure or conjugated proteins are formed. These proteins then leave the Golgi in vesicles and then fuse with the cell membrane where they are released by exocytosis. So that's how the proteins are modified in the Golgi apparatus after being transported via vesicles to its structure and then when they leave they then fuse with the cell membrane and released as exocytosis. Here is a structure of a virus. And when we look at viruses, all viruses have two features that are in common. They've got this feature here, which is the genetic material, and that genetic material can be RNA or DNA nucleic acids. They also contain a protein coat or protein capsid which surrounds the nucleic acid whether it's RNA or DNA. Now when we look at animal or plant cells and how they replicate those cells replicate by mitotic cell division where the cell divides. Here we've also got a similar process to mitotic cell division this is the replication of bacteria where the bacterial cell divides. So the question is, how do viruses replicate? And for viruses to replicate, they need to obviously make those two common structures. They need to be able to replicate the genetic material, either the RNA or DNA nucleic acid. And they also need to synthesize the proteins so they could make more of the protein coat, stroke protein capsid. The problem with replicating the genetic material is they don't have enzymes for RNA or DNA replication. Therefore, they cannot replicate the genetic material. They can't also synthesize proteins because they don't have ribosomes for protein synthesis. So if viruses want to replicate, they somehow need to replicate the genetic material and they need to replicate the proteins, but they can't do that because they don't have those structures. So here you can see this is a picture of a virus attacking a bacteria and you can see that when they attach to the bacterial host cell they then insert the genetic material. And why are they doing that? That's because they're trying to hijack or take over the host cell's processes. They're trying to make the host cell make the genetic material and proteins for them instead of them making it themselves because they don't have the enzymes or ribosomes to do that. A good examples would be HIV, which can insert its genetic material into human cells, and Ebola virus is another example. So virus replication, there are two different types you've learned in GCSE. We've got the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle, and we can see some differences here. So the lytic cycle, you could see, as we said earlier, the virus first it attaches to the host cell and you can see that it's inserting its genetic material and the host cell is making or replicating the genetic material and is also synthesizing the proteins such as the protein capsid. In the lysogenic cycle it's different. The virus attaches and inserts the genetic material but more viral genome is made because Every time the host cell uh, replicates or divides, they also make more copies of the viral genome. The described lytic cycle of virus and from GCC, remember Acella, so we remember what each of these letters stand for. So first A is attachment of virus to host cell. Then there's insertion of the virus's genetic material into the host cell. The DNA and RNA or genetic material by the host cell is then replicated. After replication of the viral genetic material, we have got synthesis of the virus protein capsid 
by translation of viral genetic material. And we need to do something with the viral genetic material and the protein capsid that's been synthesized. We need to assemble them together to make more of the virus. These virus are now in the host cell, but they need to be released. So to release, first you've got to lyse the host cell, and then they're released from the lysed host cell so they could go and infect other host cells. So a good way to remember the order of the lytic cycle is ASLR. Describe virus latency. So this is different to the lytic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, just like the lytic cycle, the virus genetic material is first inserted into the host cell. But here something different happens. The virus nucleic acid which is the RNA or DNA, or the virus's genome, is first incorporated or integrated into the host cell's DNA. So when it attaches to the host cell's DNA, you're not making or replicating the viral genome or using the genome to synthesize the protein capsid. Instead, you're just attaching or integrating it into the host cell's DNA. This means that the virus is dormant or is inactive, and we call that as non-virulent. So when do you make more copies of the virus? Well, the virus nucleic acid is replicated when the host cell divides. Because every time the host cell divides, it needs to replicate its DNA. And because the viral genome is incorporated into the host cell's DNA, therefore, every time the host cell divides, you're also making more copies of the viral genome, and every host cell that's being produced from um, cell division will also contain the viral genome. That viral genome can then detach itself from the host cell's genome and then move back into the lytic cycle. And we can see both cycles here again. In A-level biology, you've got to learn about four different types of viruses and how they replicate. So this means that we need to go over or remember protein synthesis from topic one. And protein synthesis involves two stages, transcription translation, where you've got your genetic code, the sequence of bases in the gene that provides instructions. You make a copy of that instruction. So you make a copy of the genetic code called mRNA and that mRNA can then be used as instruction to put amino acids in the correct order because each of the codons of the mRNA codes for one specific amino acid. And then what you do after you put them in order is you then put that sequence of amino acids, you join them together through peptide bonds to make your polypeptide, which can then be folded depending on which structure, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure, to make a protein. And in the first stage of protein synthesis, we've got transcription. And when we use the genetic code, we start off with the sense strand, which contains the instruction, the genetic code. And to make a copy, which is the mRNA, we actually use the opposite strand, which is the template strand, which is also known as the antisense strand. So you start off with the genetic code, the information that is, has the instruction to make the protein, that is the sense strand, but the opposite strand is used to make a copy of the sense strand, a copy of the mRNA, and that opposite strand is known as the antisense strand or the template strand. So here are the four different types of viruses we have to learn for A-level biology. We've got lambda phage, which is a DNA virus, tobacco mosaic virus, which is an RNA virus, Ebola, which is also an RNA virus, and HIV, which is an RNA retrovirus. And for A-level biology, you have to learn all four of these viruses, including their genotype and also their structure and how that relates to the mode of replication. 
So all four of these viruses have got a nucleic acid, as we mentioned earlier, and also a protein capsid. But the nucleic acid is different. It could either be DNA or RNA. Both RNA viruses, which is tobacco mosaic virus and Ebola, contain a helical protein coat, whereas the HIV RNA retrovirus has got a phospholipid bilayer envelope, and that phospholipid bilayer envelope could fuse with the host cell membrane and then insert the genome into the host cell using methods similar to endocytosis. Now, if you look at the mode of replication, we have to link it to the genome type. And we could see that lambda phage has, is a DNA virus. So when that viral DNA is inserted to the host cell, you could, the host cell uses it directly as a template to make co more copies of the viral DNA. So it could replicate the viral DNA similar to how DNA is replicated. And then you could also use the genetic code in that viral DNA in transcription to produce mRNA when synthesizing viral proteins. So that's how more viral DNA can be replicated and more viral proteins can be synthesized because you're using the DNA from lambda phage directly as if it was DNA of the genome. And then those viral DNA and viral proteins can then assemble to each other with each other to then get released after lysing the host cell. Tobacco mosaic virus is an RNA virus, but this RNA virus is a positive single-stranded RNA, which is inserted into the host cell. And it acts very similar to mRNA, like a sense strand. So you could directly translate it at the ribosome to produce viral proteins. Ebola is different because it's also an RNA virus, but it's a negative single-stranded RNA virus. So it's complementary to the mRNA. It acts more like an antisense strand. So you first have to make the complementary strand to the Ebola negative single-stranded RNA strand. Uh, so that happens in transcription. And then after the transcription, you've made your positive single-stranded RNA now. You can then send it to the ribosome to translate it to synthesize viral proteins. So in Ebola, you first have to transcribe to make the opposite strand, and then you have to translate it at the ribosome. Whereas in tobacco mosaic virus, you could directly translate the positive single-stranded RNA to produce viral proteins. HIV is an RNA retrovirus, and that viral RNA first directs a synthesis of reverse transcriptase enzyme. And because it's single-stranded, after the reverse transcriptase enzyme uh, acts upon the viral RNA, it then makes the complementary strand. And so you've now got a double-stranded DNA molecule, which corresponds to the viral genome. And that DNA can now be incorporated into the host cell's DNA, as we mentioned earlier in the lysogenic cycle. So HIV, which is an RNA retrovirus, actually um, doesn't reproduce straight away. It actually incorporates itself, as we mentioned, in the lysogenic cycle. And then you can make more copies of HIV when the cell divides, because then there'll be more viral genome. And that viral genome can then detach itself from the host cell and go through the lytic cycle to make more copies of the virus by making new viral proteins are synthesized in the ribosome and also making more of the RNA genome, which can then assemble and then after lysing the host cell, they can be released. Explain why viruses are dependent on living cells. So we know that viruses can't replicate on their own. They rely on a host cell to reproduce them. And that's because they don't have the enzymes or the ribosomes to replicate their nucleic acids, which is the genetic information, or they can't synthesize the protein capsid. So they're unable to replicate or reproduce independently because they don't have 
the appropriate organelles and enzymes. Explain why viruses are not affected by antibiotics and how antivirals work. We know that antibiotics target bacteria and the things that they target in bacteria would be things like the cell walls or how the replication occurs or translation or the metabolism of bacteria. And viruses don't have those mechanisms. They don't have cell walls. They, don't, they can't do translation because they don't have ribosomes. They don't have viral metabolism. So therefore you can't target them the same as bacteria but because viruses are not living cells. They don't have cell walls as I just mentioned. How do antivirals work? Well, the antivirals inhibit virus replication. So they target the replication directly of virus. Describe methods used to prevent the spread of Ebola. So first of all, you want to have rapid diagnosis. You want to be able to rapidly identify the disease and who's got them. Once you've identified that, you want to prevent the transmission. So that could involve isolating an infected individual, um, sterilization or disposing equipment such as bedding or clothes that they've worn. And you want these people also who are working with individuals such as those in the healthcare to wear protective clothing as well. You also want to identify who might have been in contact with an infected individual and isolate them just in case the virus has transmitted to them. And then another mark you could get in the exam is for mentioning that you could provide educational programs for the burial of corpse. And that's because the dead bodies are, can still be highly infectious. So when people know how to bury the corpse properly in a safe manner, there's a lower risk of them being infected or the virus being transmitted to them from the dead bodies. Evaluate ethical implications of using untested drug during Ebola outbreak. So obviously when there's an Ebola outbreak, um, sometimes there's a rush to, to get drugs being used by those that are infected and that means that there's a risk if you don't test them out properly. So what's the reasons for using them if you haven't tested these drugs? Ebola has a very high mortality rate and the epidemic is very difficult to control. So if people are going to die already, if there's a huge chance of them dying, then there might be a lower risk of uh, looking at the effects of the drug or looking at any negative effects of the drug. It could also help develop drug for other patients. So if the drug doesn't work, you could then use it and see what the effects are and then hope to use that or develop that for other patients in the future. Reasons against, well, when you test use these drugs, if they're untested, they've got unknown side effects. The patient, if they're ill, they might not be able to provide informed consent. So you might, be giving drugs to them without them saying yes. And then there has to be a decision on who can be tr treated if there's a limited supply of the drug. So if you've got lots of people who've got Ebola, how do you decide who to give the drug and who not to? So the conclusion is benefits may outweigh risk due to the severity of Ebola outbreak or due to the very high death rate. In the exam, this question says evaluate, so you want to give reasons for and against and then make that conclusion. 2.3 Eukaryotic cell division mitosis. Why do body cells divide? So we can see an example of body cells dividing from a fertilized egg, which is a zygote, all the way up to the fetus. So Clearly one reason for body cells dividing is for growth by producing more cells. Another reason is to repair damaged tissues. So if you've got cells that are damaged within the tissues, then you can repair the damaged tissues by replacing those cells that are damaged. Now body cells divide by mitosis, which is the type of cell division, and each cell produces two genetically identical daughter cells. So you start off with one cell and you end up with daughter cells and therefore you're increasing the number of cells. Now those two daughter cells 
are genetically identical. So they're going to contain exactly the same DNA as each other. In other words, they're clones of each other. And clearly, they're going to have the same DNA as what you started off with in the parent cell. Now, the cell cycle is actually a cyclic process of replication and cell division. So in GCC, you would have learned about mitosis. And mitosis is when the nucleus divides. And after the nucleus divides, the cytoplasm has to then divide so you can end up with two genetically identical daughter cells. Most of the time, a cell is actually during interphase, and that interphase can be split into three phases, G1, S phase, where DNA replicates, and G2. So cells aren't actually dividing most of the time, they're actually at a stage in between them dividing. So first of all, we know that in human cells, there are two copies of each chromosome, and that's because somatic body cells in humans are diploid. For instance, you contain two copies of chromosome 1 in your somatic cells, two copies of chromosome 7, two copies of chromosome 11. The reason why you have two copies of every chromosome is because one copy of the chromosome is inherited from your mother and the other copy is inherited from your father. And that's why by having two copies of every 23 chromosomes, you end up with a total of 46 chromosomes, which is why humans are diploid in terms of their cells. The problem with this is when a cell divides, if you start off with diploid cells, that means that the two daughter cells will have one copy of chromosome one each, and you want them to be genetically identical. So you might have the maternal chromosome 1 in one of the daughter cells and the paternal chromosome 1, the one inherited from the father, in the other daughter cell. That means they're not going to be genetically identical, even though both are chromosome 1. The other problem is that means they will no longer be diploid. So every time the cell divides, you end up with less and less chromosome. So before a cell divides, you actually need to replicate the DNA. And after replicating the DNA, that means that you will have two copies of every chromosome in both daughter cells, and they will be genetically identical because you've replicated the DNA before the cell has divided. So instead of ending up with 23 chromosomes and being haploid, both daughter cells will have 46 chromosomes and be genetically identical. So DNA replication before cell division occurs ensures that both daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as their parent cell, in other words, they're diploid, and also ensures that they're genetically identical. It will be exactly the same DNA. So here is a karyotype of a somatic cell in humans. You've got your 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. And here you can see that the chromosomes have been replicated, and these are identified because you can see that they are X-shaped. So if you ever see a karyotype, with the chromosome X shape, that means that the chromosomes have been replicated. And so therefore in the chromosome pairs, we know that one copy is inher we've inherited from the father and one copy we've inherited from the mother, but these are replicated versions of the chromosomes. And the example we're looking at here is chromosome three. So we've got two chromosomes three, we call them homologous chromosomes because they're identical, they wouldn't be 100% genetically identical because they'd contain the same gene, but they might have different alleles in their gene or different versions of the gene. And if we look at them, the replicate copy of the chromosome, we call that a sister chromatids. And that's because they're genetically identical and they're attached at the centromere. So this inherited copy from the mother, we've got a replicate version of it because it's X-shaped and when they're attached to each other, they're actually sister chromatids attached to each other. Those sister chromatids are genetically identical and they're attached to the centromere. Whereas if we look at the other chromosome three, which is inherited from the father, if we compare one of those chromatids from the father and one of the chromatids from the mother, we could call them non-sister chromatids. So they will have exactly the same gene because they're both chromosome three, but the alleles in the gene is different. 
And because it's different, that means they are non-sister chromatids. So sister chromatids are genetically identical to each other because they replicate copies of each other and they're attached to each other at the centromere and you'll see them as X-shaped, whereas the non-sister chromatids are when one of the chromatids is from or has been inherited from one of the parent and the other from the other parent, they contain the same gene, but the alleles within those genes will be different. Now, when a cell divides, not only does the DNA need to be replicated, you need to make sure that there's enough organelles in both daughter cells. So that means another thing that needs to happen before the cell divides is you also need to make more copies of these organelles so there's a sufficient numbers in both daughter cells. So this occurs in interphase. So in interphase, there are the two stages. We've got the replication of the DNA and you've also making more copies of organelles. And we learned from GCSC after interphase, there is mitosis or mitotic cell division where you've got the phases we've learned before called PMAP, P, prophase, M, metaphase, A, anaphase, T, telophase, and then at the end, the cytoplasm divides and you end up with cytokinesis to finish off with two daughter cells that are genetically identical. And so this animation here shows you what's actually happening to these chromosomes. You can see that chromosomes were X-shaped before, and that means that they had they were replicated and here you can see example of how the cytoplasm divides and you end up with two daughter cells. So explain what happens during the cell cycle. So from GCSC we knew IPMAP, so we had interphase, then prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase and here interphase can be split into three different um, stages. We've got G1, SCAP1, S, for synthesis and then G2 which is GAP2 and from this we know that in G1 you've got the cell that grows but then you also make extra organelles and those are obviously synthesized things like mitochondria and ribosome so even though I've written G1 and G2 separately here in both of them the cell grows and extra organelles are synthesized the cell will grow more in G1 because first you've got to grow it to make more space to make those organelles and for obviously their DNA to replicate. In the S phase of interphase, there's DNA synthesis or what I prefer to call DNA replication. And this means that you're doubling the DNA content. You're making new chromatids, which are obviously attached to each other at the centromere. These are sister chromatids, but the number of chromosomes remain the same. So if we look at the previous example, or previous slide, we saw that there was still two chromosome three, but because the sister chromatids are attached to each other on the centromere, we still call that one chromosome three, which is obviously inherited from the mother, and then the other homologous chromosome three was inherited from the father. So even after DNA replicates, there's still two chromosome threes. It's just that now they contain two sister chromatids, whereas before it was just one. Then we've got the stages of mitosis, PMAP, which is similar to what we learned in GCSC. You can see the chromosomes condense and coil, they become visible. So at the beginning, they're very thin, but they start coiling or supercoiling, and then they become visible. So here's an example you can see now where it's the chromosomes are a lot more visible now. The nuclear envelope or membrane breaks down, the centrals then pull apart and they move to opposite poles, and when they move and pull apart they form spindle microtubule fibers between them and then sister chromatids attach to the spindle fibers at the centromere and they line up in the equator during metaphase then in anaphase those spindle fiber contract and that causes the centromeres to split and they separate the sister chromatids apart by pulling them towards opposite poles and then telophase the chromosomes decontents and uncoil, and the nuclear envelope then reforms around both sets of chromosomes, or each set of chromosomes. And then you finish off with cytokinesis in animal cells. There's the filaments that contract to pull the cell membrane inwards at the equator, and that forms a cleavage furrow. And this divides the cytoplasm, which is in a plant cell, 
you've got Golgi vesicles that fuse to form cell plate and they extend outwards until it fuses with cell membrane and divides cytoplasm and the new cell wall then splits the cell into two. And in both, whether it's animal cell or plant cell, with plant cells we've got cell wall as well, you end up with two genetically identical daughter cells with the correct number of chromosomes produced. So here's additional information about cytokinesis where the cytoplasm divides and you can see in the first example you've got the formation of the cleavage furrow which is where filaments contract and they pull the cell membranes inwards as you can see the cell membrane pulling inwards at the equator and this then divides the cytoplasm until you end up with two genetically identical daughter cells. In plant cells different you can't just pull inwards because it's got a cell wall. So instead, Golgi vesicles, which form in the middle, they fuse with each other to form this central cell plate. And then that extends outwards until it fuses with the cell membrane to divide the cytoplasm. And then a new cell wall splits that cell into two. And that's how cytokinesis is different in an animal cell and in a plant cell. Core practical free is when you have to make a temporary squash preparation of a root tip so that you can show the stages of mitosis in meristem under light microscope. So in your exam, you've got to be able to describe how to prepare a microscope slide of root tissue to show the stages of mitosis. The first thing you want to do is cut the final five millimeter of meristem root tip. And that meristem contains actively dividing uh, cells that are doing mitosis. Once you've got your meristem root tip, you want to then treat them with warm acid and then remove that warm acid using water. Then you want to stain that DNA with acetic orsine, which will attach to the DNA. And then you heat to intensify the stain. You could piece the tissue to separate the cells and then apply a cover slip and squash so that you can view at very high magnification. And you can see images at the bottom of what they should look like after you've added the acidic or stain to the DNA. And you should be then be able to recognize the different phases of the cell cycle, whether it's interphase or other parts of mitosis, PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Explain how stages in cell cycle for very rapidly dividing cancerous tumor cells would be different to cells dividing slowly. So if these are very rapidly dividing cancerous tumor cells, that means it's very unlikely because most cells are doing interphase and that is the stage that is the longest. In very rapidly dividing cancerous tumor cells, that interphase is most likely to be shorter because the cell doesn't necessarily have to spend a lot of time growing. However, both mitosis and cytokinesis, in terms of their duration, is likely to remain unchanged and stay the same. And that's because they're unlikely to occur faster. So you could do interphase faster by not making the cell grow a lot. However, mitosis and cytokinesis is likely to stay the same. And that means that these tumor cells can divide very rapidly. Explain importance of DNA replication in mitosis. So as we mentioned earlier, DNA replication has to happen before uh, mitosis in cell division. And the reason for that is because you need to make genetically identical daughter cells with the correct number of chromosomes. If you didn't do DNA replication, that means the number of chromosomes would half each time the cell divides. Calculate the correct number of cells after a single cell carries out n number of mitotic cell divisions. So if a cell divides once, we know that you'd end up with two genetically identical daughter cells. If it then divides twice, you'll end up with four cells. And if you were to do it three times, you'd obviously end up with eight daughter cells. So the answer to this is that it, after n number of mitotic cell division, there's 2 to the power of n number of cells. So if you look at the example, if n equals 3 and there's 3 mitotic cell division, then it'll be 1 cell times 2 times 2 times 2. 
2 to the power of 3, which is 8 cells. So how many cells after, after n number of mitotic cell division? It's going to be 2 to the power of n. Explain why cells carry out mitosis. What is the purpose of doing mitosis in the first place? Well, as we mentioned earlier, growth. And that occurs by having more cells. You can also do repair, repairing tissues, uh, asexual reproduction, replace cells that need genetically identical cells with the same number of chromosomes. Explain advantage and disadvantage of asexual reproduction. So in asexual reproduction, that relies on mitosis because that's how you can make cells that are genetically identical. But what's the advantage of doing this and what's the disadvantage of doing it? The big advantage is that you can produce large number of offsprings rapidly as it doesn't need another individual. So in asexual reproduction, you don't need another individual to produce large number of offsprings very rapidly. However, the disadvantage is because you're doing mitosis and it relies on mitosis, that means you're going to produce cells that are genetically identical. Therefore, there's going to be a lack of genetic variation. And that lack of genetic variation could destroy all the organisms if there's a changing environment condition that is extremely unfavorable. So for instance, a new disease suddenly appears. If it affects one, it will affect all the organisms because they are, uh, they've been produced through asexual reproduction and they're genetically identical to each other. 2.4, meiosis and sexual reproduction. This is a diagram of a karyotype for both diploid cells and haploid cells. And for the diploid cells, you can see there are two copies of every single type of chromosome. So there's two chromosome one, two chromosome two, two chromosome three. So diploid cells is when you have two sets of chromosomes, and these can be found in our somatic cells, which are the body cells. And there's the reason why there's two copies is because one copy it was inherited from the mother and the other copy was inherited from the father and that's why there's two copies of every single type of chromosome whereas in haploid cells there's only one copy so haploid cells is when there's only one set of chromosomes an example of that would be in gametes so in human males that would be the sperm whereas females that would be the egg and here you can see an animation of meiosis. And you can see the centrals pulling apart and moving to opposite poles. And when they do that, the spindle fibers form. And then they attach to the centromere of the homologous chromosomes. And then the chromosomes move to opposite poles, just like in mitosis. But here, it's like mitosis happening twice in meiosis. So there's actually ending up with four daughter cells instead of two. And you can see if you look at the chromosomes, they're not exactly the same. So they're genetically different to each other. So describe how meiosis results in haploid gametes. First of all, meiosis can be split into two parts. We've got meiosis one. And in meiosis one, you have very similar to what happens in mitosis. You've got PMAT, so you've got prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1. So you've got the same um, identical things that happen as in mitosis. One of the differences is that obviously the DNA replicates before meiosis starts, just like in mitosis. And that means you've got homologous chromosomes. So you've got two chromosome 1s, but they've been replicated. So you've got two sister chromatids of the paternal chromosome 1 and two sister chromatids of the maternal chromosome 1 and so on for every other chromosome. However, when the cell divides here, the homologous chromosomes start separating and moving to opposite poles. So the paternal chromosome 1 and the maternal chromosome 1 will move to opposite poles. And the way they move can be different. So just because paternal chromosome 1 moves to one pole, it doesn't mean that all the paternal chromosomes, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, that was inherited from the father, would move to the same pole. And that means you could end up with lots of different combinations. So in the meiosis 1, you've got the homologous chromosomes that 
separate and they move to opposite poles. So mitosis 1 is a reduction division as the chromosome numbers halved to form haploid cells. In other words, you started off with two chromosome 1s, but those homologous pairs now move to opposite poles. So now each daughter cell will have only one copy of chromosome 1. And again, they'll have one copy of chromosome 2 and one from chromosome 3. But where they've inherited that chromosome, it could be either from the mother or the father for each chromosome number. In myosis 1, during prophase, you've also got something called crossing over. So those homologous chromosomes, for instance, homologous chromosome 1, they actually um, split, split and they exchange parts of their chromosomes. That's something I'll talk about in the next slide. So prophase 1, crossing over of non-sister chromatids happen, and that increases genetic variation. So obviously crossing over of sister chromatids wouldn't happen because you'd just be exchanging the same genetic information. So it happens between non-sister chromatids, in other words, between chromatids of homologous chromosomes where the genes would be the same, but the alleles could be different. Then in anaphase 1, you've got homologous chromosomes that separate. So you end up with haploid cells at the end of meiosis 1. And that happens in anaphase 1. So that's because homologous chromosomes are separating. So one of the chromosome 1 will move to one pole, and the other chromosome 1 will move to the other pole, and so on for every other chromosome. And then the other part of meiosis is meiosis 2. Now meiosis 2 is slightly different to meiosis 1, because here you've got sister chromatids that separate. So you had your replicated. Uh, chromosomes, they were X-shaped, but now they separate in the centromere and move to opposite poles. So the difference between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 is in meiosis 1, during anaphase, the homologous chromosomes are separating, but in anaphase 2 of meiosis 2, the sister chromatids separate and move to opposite poles. And obviously, again, which combination moves to which poles? They're very likely to be genetically identical, but the difference would be due to crossing over and that increases genetic variation. And that means you end up with four genetically different um, daughter cells. So these four haploid gametes produced from the diploid cells where the chromosome numbers are halved. And because they're genetically different to each other, that increases genetic variation. So these haploid gametes are all going to have a huge amount of genetic variation. And that means that the eggs and sperm will have genetic variation in them, which means that siblings would be different to each other. So here again, we could see meiosis. You could see the centrals pulling apart, moving to opposite poles. The spindle pipe is forming. You've got your homologous chromosome 1 and 2 here. I can see in the first cell division or the first nuclear division, the homologous chromosomes separate and move to opposite poles. And then you've got meiosis 2 after the cell divides. Got the centrals again pulling apart, but this time round in anaphase 2, you've got the chromatids separating and pulling apart to opposite poles, and you end up with four daughter cells that are genetically different, and these will then for be gametes, and they are also haploid. Explain how meiosis results in genetic variation. So this is an image that we saw earlier, which is crossing over. So crossing over or recombination happens in prophase 1. So it actually happens before anaphase 1, before the homologous chromosomes separate and move to opposite poles. They first will align with each other and crossing over will happen. And to describe crossing over in your exam, what you say is homologous chromosomes line up. So it doesn't matter if it's homologous chromosome 1 or homologous chromosome 2 or 3. The paternal and maternal chromosome 1 will line up together, then maternal and paternal chromosome 2 will line up together. And when they do that, a chiasmata forms. And in that chiasmata, there's a break in DNA of non sister chromatids plus exchange of genetic information, and that results in new and different combination of alleles. And we call those chromosomes now recombinant chromosomes because they have the same gene. But the combination of alleles has now different because 
there have been exchange between the maternal and paternal um, of the same chromosome type of the same homologous chromosomes. Another thing that increases genetic variation, so if we look at this example here, when you've got chromosome 1 and chromosome 2 homologous pairs, when they move to opposite poles and you've got the maternal moving to one pole and the paternal moving to one pole of chromosome 1, when chromosome 2 separate and move to opposite poles, again, they can move randomly. Not all the maternal has to move to one pole and not all the paternal has to move to one pole. You could end up with lots of different combinations of chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. This is known as independent or random assortment and it happens in metaphase 1 and that results in different combinations of chromatids. Another thing that increases genetic variation is when an organism is produced, so for instance a zygote, you're getting a contribution from both parents. So that's known as random fertilization and that enables contribution of DNA genes or alleles from two individuals and that provides further genetic variation. So meiosis, which involves sexual reproduction, is a source of genetic variation and that allows organisms to adapt to changing environment. So if the environment changes, some of those variants will have a advantage and that means that they're more likely to survive. So the whole idea of meiosis producing genetic variation in the population means that um, that species is likely to survive, not necessarily every single organism in the population, but those that have an advantage, which helps the survival of the species. And here we could actually see some of these ideas that produce genetic variation. So we've got crossing over here that's happened between homologous chromosome 1 of the non sister chromatids, and that happened, um, and also in chromosome 2, it also happened as well. And they can see um, random assortment. So in this case here, chromosome 1, let's say maternal, is with chromosome 2 paternal. So it could also be the other way around. And then you end up with four daughter cells that are genetically different to each other, that are haploid cells, and it could randomly fuse or fertilize with another haploid cell, and that increases genetic variation. Explain how chromosomal mutations occur, including Down syndrome and Turner syndrome. Here's an example of a chromosomal mutation, and you can see in the example that parts of a chromosome has broken off and joined another non-homologous chromosome. So this is known as translocation. The definition is part of a chromosome breaks off and joins another non-homologous chromosome. And there are two types of translocation. There's unbalanced translocation and balanced translocation. In the example of the unbalanced translocation, you could see that parts of the chromosome is broken off and joined another non-homologous chromosome, whereas in balance, both chromosomes have got parts that are broken off and they've exchanged that, but this is between non-homologous chromosome. Another type of chromosomal mutation is non-disjunction. And in non-disjunction, you've got a failure of separation. So we know that in myosis 1, in anaphase 1, there is separation of homologous chromosomes, which move to opposite poles. But what happens if they fail to separate and both homologous chromosome, for instance, one, move to the same pole. That means half of your gametes are going to have an extra chromosome one, and then half of the gametes are going to have no chromosome one. When they fuse with another gamete, you'll end up with a zygote that has an extra chromosome, or a zygote that has one less chromosome. And the same thing could also happen when there's a failure of separation in sister chromatids in anaphase 2 of meiosis 2. So again, you could end up with some daughter cells that are produced in meiosis that have an extra chromosome, or they could have one less chromosome. And again, if they fuse with another gamete in fertilization, you're going to end up with an extra chromosome of one of the types or one less. 
So in non-disjunction, homologous chromosomes, either in anaphase 1 or sister chromatids in anaphase 2, fail to separate, and that results in gametes with either two copies or no copies of that chromosome. And that means the zygote or the somatic cells are aneuploidy. They have either one extra or one less due to abnormal total number of chromosomes. So humans have got 23 pairs, which is 46 chromosomes in total. If they have one extra, there'll be 47 chromosomes. If they have one less, there'll be 45 chromosomes. So that's known as aneuploidy when there's an abnormal total number of chromosomes. And two examples you've got to know in your exam are Downs and Turner syndrome. In Down syndrome, there is non-disjunction, so in other words, non-separation of chromosome 21. So both chromosome 21 moves to the same pole. And that means that your gametes contain two chromosome 21. And when it fertilizes with another gamete, you'll end up with three chromosome 21, and that's known as trisomy 21. And trisomy, if you have more than the normal two, that means we call that polysomy. Another example of non-disjunction is Turner syndrome. And here there's non-disjunction of the sex chromosome in males. So there's no sex chromosomes in the sperm. So this is where the X or the Y both move to the same pole. And then in the other daughter cell, there's no X or Y sex chromosome. And when that fuses with an egg, an ovum that does contain one X chromosome, you end up with an XO genotype in the zygote in the fertilized egg and that's known as monosomy when you've only got one copy of that chromosome. So Turner syndrome is due to non-disjunction of sex chromosome, no sex chromosome, X or Y in the sperm, and then it's monosomy because it fuses with one X chromosome from the ovum with an XO genotype in the fertilized egg which is a zygote. Explain process of gametogenesis. So we know what gametogenesis is. That's the formation of gametes by meiosis in sex organs. So here's an example of what happens. And there's two different types of gametogenesis. We've got eugenesis, which is the formation of the ovum in the ovary, and spermatogenesis, which is the formation of the spermatozoa, in the testes. And in both of them, you start off with a diploid primordial germ cells, and that diploid primordial germ cells divide by mitosis to form diploid eugonia in females or diploid spermatogonia in males. Then these cells grow bigger, and when they grow bigger, they become primary oocytes in eugenesis or primary spermatocytes in spermatogenesis. So effectively you start off with mitosis of the primordial germ cells and then these cells become larger during the growth phase and then after they've grown larger you then start off with meiosis. So the first meiotic division results in a larger haploid secondary oocyte and a smaller degenerate polar body in, in eugenesis. However in Spermatogenesis, you end up with two haploid secondary spermatocytes. So remember, this is in the first mitotic division where you start off with one cell, so you're going to end up with two daughter cells. After you've done the second mitotic division, then you'll end up with four daughter cells. In the second mitotic division, that takes place after fertilization in eugenesis and it results in one haploid ovum and um, another degenerate polar body. So therefore, in females, you start off with the diploid primordial germ cells, but you end up in eugenesis with one large ovum and three smaller degenerate polar body. However, in spermatogenesis, after the second mighty division, which happens straight away, that results in four haploid spermatids. And those spermatids haven't fully specialized yet. So they continue differentiation, which differentiate to form spermatozoa, which is the sperm cell, which now has a tail and other specialized features.
Describe how products of spermatogenesis differ from oogenesis in mammals. So how do the products of spermatogenesis, which is the spermatozoa, differ from oogenesis, which is the ovum? And they could also be the secondary oocyte because in females, the oogenesis doesn't fully complete. Only the first mitotic division happens. The second mitotic division only happens after fertilization. So here we could see the structures of the spermatozoa and the ovum. We can see the spermatozoa contains acrosome. So that acrosome is the membrane-bound storage site for enzymes at the front, and they digest the surrounding ovum. It digests the zona pellucida, which is the jelly layer of the ovum. And that helps the sperm to penetrate so that the nucleus that is haploid can then um, insert into the ovum and fuse with the haploid nucleus of the ovum in fertilization. Spermatozoa is also motile. And the reason why it's motile is because they have a flagella, which is the tail. It also has microtubules, and that microtubules help with the movement of the tail. Um, so therefore making the spermatozoa motile. And the last um, difference is that a higher numbers of spermatozoa are produced in the ova. And that's because degenerate polar bodies are produced in eugenesis. So for every four daughter cells, three of them are the degenerate polar body cells, whereas in spermatozoa you produce four haploid spermatozoa in spermatogenesis. Okay, differences in the secondary oocyte or the ovum. First of all, it's a larger cell. The reason why it's a larger cell is obviously the cytoplasm is much larger. So the reason why you have the cytoplasm is during meiosis, there's uneven separation of the cytoplasm in cytokinesis. So more of the cytoplasm goes towards the ovum and less of it goes towards the degenerate polar body. And the reason why you want to have a larger cytoplasm is because you could store more food stores there. And that's obviously very helpful after the ovum has become fertilized to help it grow. Uh, the secondary oocyte of the ovum is surrounded by the zona pellucida, which is jelly-like layer. And it also has some follicle cells and eugenesis produces polar bodies which obviously isn't produced in um, spermatogenesis. Explain why egg cell is much larger than head of sperm cell. So as we said earlier the cytoplasm contains large food stores and that large food stores um, is for energy that is released by respiration and that energy released by respiration can then be used in cell division until the fertilized egg um, or the grown fertilized egg then gets implanted and then could get food from the mother. So by having that larger cytoplasm, more food stores are available for the cell when it divides. You can look at the structure of the ovum. We can see it's made of zona pellucida, which is the jelly-like layer. It's got the cell surface membrane and cytoplasm with the food stores. It's got a haploid nucleus. That's the same in the sperm, which also got haploid nucleus. The sperm or the spermatozoa obviously has got the acrosome, which is the digestive enzymes that penetrate or digest the zona pellucida. It's got its um, flagella, uh, which makes it motile due to the flagellum. And then obviously for movement, you need energy. So spermatozoa have got lots and lots of mitochondria. Explain why producing spermatids instead of mature spermatozoa causes infertility. So spermatids is when it hasn't fully differentiated yet. So therefore there'll be no flagellum or fewer mitochondria. So the spermatids can't swim to the egg. And if it hasn't fully developed, there'll be no acrosome or fewer enzymes, so can't penetrate 
the zona pellucida, the fertilized egg. Explain events of fertilization in mammals. So here we've got a diagram of how fertilization occurs. And first of all, you've got contact of sperm with the secondary oocyte. Remember in females, the second mitotic division hasn't occurred fully. And that causes the release of digestive enzymes from the acrosomes. Once that happened, cortical granules in the secondary oocyte release enzymes. So this is from the secondary oocyte of the female. And when it releases those enzymes, it hardens the zona pellucida and that creates a fertilization membrane. And the whole point of this is clearly to stop additional sperm from fertilizing the ovum. Anaphase 2 then occurs in the secondary oocyte to form the ovum and the nuclei of sperm and the oocyte of the ovum now fuses together and that forms a zygote. Explain early development of embryo to blastocyst stage. So once we've got the zygote, it will now develop into an embryo. So we can see first we've got the zygote, which is the fertilized egg. And you can see that it is forming into an embryo. So we've got something called a morilla, which is a very early embryo. And these contain totipotent stem cells. And the reason why they're totipotent stem cells is because they got the potential to differentiate or specialize into all the different types of cells. So these are the very earliest cells from the zygote to the morilla the fertilized egg to very, very early embryo stage, they're totipotent stem cells, potential to differentiate or specialize into every single type of cell. And to go from that zygote, which is a fertilized egg from one cell into the morella, which has got roughly around eight cells, obviously you've got a cell division occurring. occurring. This is mitotic cell division and you start off with one larger cell in the zygote but then you end up with lots of really small cells that are genetically identical and that means that these cells are doing mitosis rapidly without the cells growing so there's a shortening of the interphase stage of g1 and g2 and this is known as cleavage process so cleavage process increases the cell numbers by mitosis without growth where cells become progressively smaller. So you're dividing and producing more cells, but because there isn't a lot of growth phase, these cells are much smaller because the cytoplasm isn't increasing. So every time the cell division happens, the cytoplasm becomes smaller and smaller per cell. And that forms a hollow embryo structure known as the blastocyst with thin cell layer surrounded by a fluid filled cavity. So that's what you end up with after the morilla stage. That blastocyst is a late embryo or a later embryo. And when we look at the structure of that blastocyst, it's got an inner cell mass and, and it's also got a trophoblastic cells, which is the outside part of the blastocyst. The inner cell mass contains pluripotent stem cells. So we started off with totipotent stem cells from the zygote to the morella. But once it reaches the blastocyst stage, which is the late embryo, the inner cell mass contains pluripotent stem cells. And that gives rise to the embryonic cells of most cell types. So it's going to become all the other embryonic cells in the future, or most types of cells in the future. But it cannot turn into the extra embryonic tissue, such as the placenta, as they can only differentiate to limited cell types. So in other words, there's already been now a slight amount of differentiation so that inner cell mass could become every single type of cell except for some of the extra embryonic tissue such as the placenta so we call it pluripotent stem cells instead of totipotent stem cells the trophoblast cells which is the outside part of the blastocyst becomes the extra embryonic tissue such as the placenta so you can see that it started to differentiate now Explain how pollen grain and embryo sac form. 
So pollen grains are made in the anther and they carry male plant gametes. So here's a diagram showing how the male plant gamete forms. And you start off with a diploid microspore mother cell. And that diploid microspore mother cell divides by meiosis. So in eugenesis and spermogenesis, in other words, gametogenesis in humans, we just had mitosis at the beginning of the primordial germ cells. And then there was the first meiotic, um, or the first meiotic cell division, then the second meiotic cell division. So meiosis then occurs after mitosis. Here is slightly different in plants. In plants, you start off with the diploid microscope mother cell, but it divides by meiosis firm first. And obviously, if you divide by meiosis, you're going to end up with four daughter cells. So we're going to call them four haploid microspores. And those microspores then undergo mitosis to form pollen grain, which is the microgamete. And they're going to contain two haploid nuclei, the tube nucleus and the genitive nucleus, which is the male gamete. So there's two nucleus, the tube nucleus and the genitive nucleus. The genitive nucleus is the one that's the male gamete. So in other words, there's nuclear division, but the cell doesn't necessarily divide and you end up with two nucleus after mitosis occurs. And one of the nucleus is the tube nucleus, the other nucleus is the genitive nucleus, the male gamete. In terms of the embryo sac and how it forms, it forms in the ovule and carries the female plant gamete. It's very similar to how the pollen grain is formed. Again, you start off with a diploid mother cell, but this is a diploid megaspore mother cell, and they divide by meiosis to form four haploid megaspores. Now, three of those haploid megaspores are degenerate, but only one of them will grow. So it's very similar to um, eugenesis. The megaspore, that one megaspore that hasn't degenerated, will undergo three mitotic cell division. And when it does that, that results in an embryo sac containing an egg cell, which is the megagamete, but it also contains two polar nuclei and lots of other smaller cells. So that's how the embryo sac and the pollen grains are formed, but now they have to fuse with each other to in fertilization. So explain how male nuclei reach the embryo sac in plants so when pollen grain lands on so if we look at this diagram here the stigma during pollination the genitive nucleus divides by mitosis so remember we had the tube nucleus and the genitive nucleus and the genitive nucleus is the male gamete and it divides by mitosis to produce two male genitive gamete nuclei so now you've got two of them pollen tube enzymes digest the style tissue and that pollen tube grows to transport both the genitive nuclei to the ovule. So we started off with two nuclei, the tube nucleus and the genitive nucleus. The genitive nucleus then did mitosis, so you have two of them. You have two male genitive gamete nuclei. And then the tube nuclei the, produces pollen tube enzymes that digest the style tissue. And a pollen tube then grows all the way to transport both the genitive nuclei to the ovule. Explain process of double fertilization inside embryo sac. So once those two genitive nuclei reach the ovule, what happens? How does double fertilization occur? One of the male genitive gamete fertilizes the female gamete, and that's going to produce the zygote or the embryo. The other male genitive gamete fertilizes both the polar nuclei or the diploid endosperm nucleus. And because it's a diploid endosperm nucleus fusing with one of the male gamete, that means you can end up with a triploid. So this is known as a triploid endosperm nucleus that forms. So effectively, you're producing a zygote with one of the male genitive gamete, but with the other male genitive gamete, you're producing a tip triploid endosperm nucleus when it fuses with both the polar nuclei of the embryo sac.
that endosperm, the triploid endosperm nucleus, that endosperm is a store of starch or proteins of oils. So it has nutrients for storage so to help the fertilized zygote to then grow. And here's a diagram of fertilization in plants. Core practical four, investigate effects of sucrose concentrations on pollen tube growth or germination. Devise a method that could be used to investigate effect of sucrose concentration on pollen germination. So in any of these investigations, you got to know what the independent variable is, what the dependent variable is, and what are the control variables. In this case, we are looking at the effect of sucrose concentration on pollen germination. So that means you've got to have a range of sucrose concentrations. And in the exam, if you want to get marked, not only do you have to mention the independent variable, you want to state that you'd use a range of five different types. So the independent variable is where you put pollen grains in a range of or five different sucrose concentrations. And then you've got to measure which is the dependent variable. In this case here, there are two different types or two different things you can measure. You could either measure the length of the pollen tubes or you can measure what the percentage germination is. In terms of control variable, keeping the temperature constant is one of them. Now, when you're measuring the pollen tubes, you'd use a 100 times magnification, or you could obviously calculate the percentage germination. You could either do one or the other. But if you're going to measure the pollen tubes, because they're um, very hard to see in terms of length, after using the 100 times magnification to measure them, you'd have to use a calibrated IP scratchable. So mentioning that in the exam would get you marks. So that's how you'd um, measure the dependent variable. Or you could also calculate the percentage germination. That's the other thing that could you could do depending on what investigation it is. In terms of when you'd measure it, you want to do one hour intervals. So you'd measure several pollen tubes after that one hour interval. The reason for measuring several of them is because then you could calculate a mean. Sketch suitable graph to show results. So what would be on the x-axis, y-axis, and what would the graph show? So we know the x-axis should be the independent variable and the y-axis should be the dependent variable. So on the x-axis should be the sucrose concentration. You should at least have a range or minimum range of five different types, starting from zero all the way to whatever your range is. And then the y-axis, you could either have the mean pollen tube length or you could have the percentage germination, depending on what was measured. And in terms of the results of what the graph should show, realistically, it would show a positive correlation where a higher concentration of sucrose would increase the percentage germination or increase the mean pollen tube length. Sometimes the uh, correlation then becomes negative afterwards, but realistically, uh, for most sucrose concentration, there should be an increase.